Hello, and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. My name is Isaac Zaman, and I'm originally from the greater Madison area. I am a rising senior in the College of Agriculture Life Sciences, studying horticulture here at UW-Madison. I'm pleased to introduce my boss, Johanna Oosterwick, instructor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Allen Centennial Garden. Today, Johanna will share about how she can't imagine teaching with or about plants without being in a garden. Since spring, she has developed creative ways to teach horticulture in the garden while keeping the students safe. She will also share new skills that were learned and that adapted the class structure needed to maintain the positive environment for learning. In addition to her role at Allen Centennial Garden, Johanna also serves as the manager of the DC Smith Greenhouse and as an instructor in the UW Department of Horticulture. She brings a long history with the Allen Centennial Garden and has a strong commitment to its mission as a living laboratory and public garden. Please welcome my friend, my boss, and my teacher, Johanna Oosterwick. <laughs> Thank you, Isaac. That was a great introduction. I really appreciate it. Now go get to work. You got supposed, it. <laughs> you're supposed to be working. Um, Thank you all for joining us today. As Isaac said, I'm Johanna Osterweich, and my multiple roles at the university are as an instructor for the Department of Horticulture. I teach ornamental plants and greenhouse cultivation, and I'm also the manager of the DC Smith Instructional Greenhouse, which supports teaching for all the plant sciences courses in the College of Agriculture. For the past year, I've also taken on um, an additional role working with the Allen Centennial Garden. Uh, however, we now have a permanent director in place, so I've been happy to give that up, but it's uh, allowed me to work even more intimately with the garden, which is, you know, just like the greenhouse, a critical classroom. This year in particular has been, for all of us, so very different, um, but the gardens and the greenhouses have help to make it work. So to be able to have these uh, exceptional facilities really made teaching for me possible this year. I have been working with plants for more than 30 years. Um, I did get a very early start in life working uh, on a farm with my parents, but I knew right away when I went to college that horticulture was going to be the place for me. And some things that I love about horticulture are, I guess in the first place, how accessible it is. Plants welcome all ages and abilities. Um, this is a couple years ago, a workshop we had here at the greenhouse. The master gardeners or group, many of them retirees, most of them not trained horticulturists, but Plants are accessible. Plants are something that you can learn about whether um, you come to it late in life or start very young, well, young as well. For the past year, we haven't been able to have field trips or tours. We're not quite to that point yet, but I really was thrilled last month when the university allowed us to open up the buildings to the public again. So we're once again welcoming visitors into the greenhouses and the gardens, um, although we don't at the moment have um, tours through the greenhouses. You can visit the gardens and you should definitely check out, I think every other Sunday, uh, starting in a few weeks, they'll be having a concert series there. So please come visit us and come join us. In addition to gardening being for everyone, um, in some ways it seems to me that it's about everything as well. Um, gardening, Horticulture is an integrated field. We pull from many, many disciplines when we learn and we teach about plants. Uh, in one case here, this is a plant that I teach in my ornamental plants class, the white snake root. You've probably seen this in your garden. Maybe you didn't know what it was. Uh, it is sometimes sold as an ornamental, but more often people find it in their gardens and they're like, where did this come from? What is it? It's a bit of a weed uh, and you can see it growing there literally out of a crack uh, in the wall by the Steenbach Library just down the street from me. 
But this is a plant that I enjoy teaching. It is very pretty. It's actually a native plant to Wisconsin and much of North America. But one reason I like teaching about this particular plant, I don't recommend it as a garden ornamental. Um, in fact, it's uh, on a list of plants that I title nuisance plants. The topic is, are you sure you want to plant that? This is a little bit of a weed, but it's got a great history. And horticulture, plant science allows us to teach history and art. The white snake root, um, many plants, I know I teach ornamentals, but plants have other uses as well beyond just their beauty. And white snake root can be used to make a poultice to treat snake bites. But it's also a plant that has links to history. Uh, it was thought to be the cause, is thought to be the cause, of a disease called milk sickness, which caused a lot of uh, death and heartbreak in the early 19th century. In fact, uh, Nancy Lincoln, President Lincoln's mother, was thought to have died of that. Um, the connection between the plant and the disease, cows would eat it, they would be relatively unaffected, but then people who drank the milk would get sick. Settlers had a hard time figuring out why they were getting ill, they couldn't get it, and the connection was attributed to a doctor, Anna Hobbs uh, Bixby. We remember her name, but she had got her information from a Shawnee woman, and we don't have the name of that woman. So one thing I like to teach when I teach about plants is to teach history as well. Um, it's also a good time to remind ourselves that the University of Wisconsin occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place that their nation called Dejope since time immemorial. This is a picture of Observatory Hill, just a couple of blocks from where I am sitting. And when I teach about this plant, this is the setting that I choose. I walk with students across campus. We find the plants in the gardens, or in the case of this one, um, in some of the more scrubby, untended patches. But this observatory hill has a much longer history than just the history of the university. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. And decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state government repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. The history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. And today, UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. And that is a statement from the uh, UW-Madison recognizing the history of this location. But like I said, one of my thing, favorite things about horticulture is that it is integrated and you can find learning with plants in very unexpected places. So in addition to history, horticulture is sometimes referred to as the art and science of growing plants. These students who are all graduated now, but worked for me a few years ago, um, you can see that they are very happy and they are justifiably proud of themselves because the day before this, that waterfall wasn't working. So these students worked with me, we drained the pond, cleaned it out and repaired the pump. So yes, I teach horticulture, but growing in greenhouses, growing in gardens, sometimes also means dipping into the other fields of plumbing and a little bit of electrical work as well. Horticulture is about art as much as it is about science. It pulls from botany, chemistry, culture and history, engineering, even math. All of these things should and can be taught in the garden. And my students love being in the greenhouse and in the garden. Again, this photo is from a few years ago. Um, we fill that room that Isaac was just in during his introduction, filled with students, filled with plants. Um, and even this past year, we brought them into the garden and into the greenhouse as much as possible. And Anthony, if you would please share that first video that I gave you. And of course it makes sense to teach botany and plant identification in particular in the garden and in the greenhouse. 
we can do a lot with pictures just like with the white snake root having plants in context teaches us much much more we can learn about where they grow are they in the hot sun what other plants are they growing with as we walk through we get to experience how they're growing how they're doing do they prefer the cool shade do they need special facilities like this rock garden the rocks there are providing additional drainage because that's what these plants need so knowing where plants grow who they grow with and what other organisms they interact with birds bugs all of this context gives us clues to how the plants grow and helps to embed in my students' minds the information that they need to know about plants. I can tell you that sunflowers get tall, but that doesn't communicate the feeling that you get when they loom over you 10 or 12 feet up in the air. The Gaura lindheimeri. White Gaura is the common name, but whirling butterflies is another name that I hear for this plant. This fringe tree is currently blooming in the Allen Garden. One of the struggles I've had this year is that pictures just don't tell the full story. It shows you how lovely this plant is, but something that it doesn't share is the rich fragrance. I can't send that through the screen to you and share it with you. Earlier this spring, Bergenia cordifolia, the heartleaf Bergenia, were blooming in the gardens. Did you know that they have another name? If you can hear that, listen closely. It's also called pig squeak, because if you rub the leaves between your fingers, you get that kind of grunting sound. Pictures do work somewhat, and we use them quite a bit. So I was able to keep my classes smaller and not have too many people too close together. We were able to do social distancing by spreading people out. We could show videos of plants and show you this begonia here, that it has two different kinds of flowers. But to teach this fall, we put the lectures online and we still brought the students into the garden for our plant walks. And Anthony, would you um, send that, uh, send the screen back to me? So our plant walks were in the greenhouse and the gardens, but we also um, split up the classes so that fewer students would be in one place at one time. But also allowing them to get very up close and personal with the plants and even to have a little bit of fun. So this class um, is doing something called flower pounding, where we take the plants, um, mash them against a piece of muslin, and then take an imprint. And yes, that is Isaac from before. He took my class last fall. So we even did manage to have um, a little bit of fun this semester, but again, by using the outdoor environment as much as possible and reducing class sizes as well to help keep people safe. Keeping the group small was definitely important, but there was another factor involved in staying healthy indoors. And we did eventually have to move inside uh, after teaching the outdoor um, plants. I also teach house plants indoors. And when you are working inside with plants, small class sizes to maintain social distance is very helpful, but it's also exceptionally useful to keep the air moving, to bring fresh air in and exhaust the air that we've all been rebreathing into. It's recommended that you have a ventilation rate that ACH is air changes per hour. Um, ideal is six times an hour, all of the air in the room gets exhausted out and replaced with fresh air from outside. So your goal there is six air changes per hour. That's tricky to get, particularly in our modern buildings that don't like to open up. 
Um, for example, your bathroom fan, um, it moves about 80 cubic feet per minute, which is great for your bathroom, but won't do the whole house. Um, on the other hand, my greenhouse fans, and you can see each greenhouse has two very large exhaust fans. Um, these move about 5,000 cubic feet per minute. So they're designed for solar heat gain to remove the air that's heated during the day. Um, well, six, hour, six air changes per minute, no problem. My building's designed for, or six air changes per hour is no problem when your building is designed for one air change per minute. This is one reason why I felt comfortable bringing my students inside into the greenhouse. Again, we didn't sit in a classroom. We used the greenhouse space and increased the ventilation to keep that air moving and to reduce the chance of disease transmission. Although I taught in person, it wasn't an option for every other instructor and not for every student. And I did end up with a lot of empty greenhouse space. So the DC Smith greenhouse is the teaching space for instructors in plant science who want to teach about plants. Usually we would have, you know, wall to wall plants in there. But last August, I was looking at a lot of empty space. We found some alternatives. We found some alternatives. Um, here we uh, made the space available to dry down onions that were grown on one of the student farms. But still, I only needed that space for a few weeks to dry down the onion tops. So instead, since I had about three empty greenhouses and I felt comfortable teaching in the greenhouse, I offered a brand new course. So Usually in the spring, I teach greenhouse cultivation. I adapted that a little bit and invited students to enroll in a class in controlled environment food production, in particular hydroponics and season extension, which are what greenhouses are good for. Uh, we did do some season extension at the Allen Centennial Garden, where we put up hoops on the, um, in the vegetable garden. Actually, we harvested spinach out of there just this spring. Um, but the students were able to come in in small groups into the greenhouse and work hands-on learning about food production. We grew lettuces in tanks, as you can see here, we're harvesting those. They're wonderful root systems that grow in the water. Vine crops, cucumbers, tomatoes, green peppers. And this was, for me, a learning experience. Like I said, I've been working in plant care for over 30 years and in greenhouses for 20 of that. But this was the first year I really worked intensely in hydroponic setups. So we did some experiments with this setup. So we have rock wool, perlite, and hydrotone, which are the um, different medias that we used. You can see them there growing in the Dutch bucket system. They get um, flooded with media. And then, um, of course, we harvested. We had three different cultivars, sun peach, toronjina, and edox. Here we've got the results. You can see um, that's a lot of numbers. It's a little bit easier to, um, to see in a graph. We had um, excellent results. And one thing I noted was that regardless of cultivar, the rock wool had the highest uh, yield for each one. So that was something that I was able to learn this year. Here is another example of one of our um, harvests. <laughs> we grew leafy greens, but we also grew um, flowers. Nasturtiums are edible flowers. So we would throw a few of those into the bundles of um, leafy greens for uh, the food pantries that we supplied. Uh, in all, <laughs> Since last September, when most of these were planted, we've harvested over 300 pounds uh, of food. So the students planted these crops last fall, and then my spring semester class continued to grow them on.
We first started harvesting in October, but everything was planted in September. And like I said, there's more to learning about horticulture than just learning how to grow plants. Business skills, a lot of math can be involved if you're interested. So we did a cost analysis with my students of, well, which one of our crops made the most sense to grow um, if we were trying to grow a business? And really what it came down to was how soon could we get crops out of our plants? The greens took about four weeks before we could harvest and replant. Um, so it ended up costing just over a dollar um, a kilogram. The tomatoes, on the other hand, didn't start fruiting until December. We planted those in September. The peppers, we had to wait until February before we got our first harvest. And the cucumbers, on the other hand, turned out to be um, quite surprisingly, they would fruit within two months, didn't have to sit around waiting for them to grow in the greenhouse. Because remember, before you can start harvesting, you still have a lot of inputs in fertilizer, water, hiring um, employees to care for those, the setup of the hydroponic systems. So we calculated all of this and you know, looking at the results, there's a reason why um, greenhouses, indoor farms, the ones that are growing fresh local produce throughout the year, they're producing things that don't take as many inputs like those leafy greens or things that they can um, net a very high profit off of. Tomatoes that are grown locally in January, um, someone can justify that cost to grow them. Um, this is also a new um, setup for me. So hopefully if I do this again year after year, um, I'll get so much better at growing them that the yields will increase as well. Um, but these are some of the things that we look at and that I teach my students. Anthony, would you show that um, second video? Another thing that I did for my students was create videos that would show them what I was doing in the greenhouse when they couldn't come in. Because last May, uh, well, last March, April, and May, students weren't allowed in the greenhouse at all. So I created an unboxing video showing them um, a little bit of entomology, insect studies. If you're going to grow plants, well, chances are those plants are going to be affected by pests. So one of the ways that we control pests in the greenhouse is with beneficial pest controls. Those cryptolamus beetles and also a um, nematode called Steinernema feltiae. This is a roundworm. Uh, it's a nematode. Often we don't like nematodes because they are pests. Um, but in this case, I wanted them around. I released the nematodes and I released the mealybug beetles into the greenhouses to control pests. And the cryptolamus beetles, they're just a little ladybird type beetle. And if you're familiar with ladybugs, you know that they eat a lot of our garden pests. In the greenhouse, I can release these cryptolamus montrusieri, the mealybug destroyers, and they eat that white fuzz there uh, is the residue of mealybugs which are an annoying houseplant pest if you have houseplants. I uh, had to be careful not to pick up any hitchhikers. They like to crawl on my clothes as well. If you are um, a houseplant caretaker, you might be familiar with another pest. This is the fungus gnat that's been picked up on the leaves of this carnivorous plant. This is the butterwort. It has sticky leaves and acts like flypaper to trap those flies and then um, dissolve and absorb their nutrients. But fungus gnats are a bit of a nuisance pest to many homeowners and to greenhouse managers in particular as well. Um, just like they stick to the leaves of the butterwort, we can trap them on these yellow, yellow sticky cards. We track the population with that, watching every week to see how many um, are in the greenhouse, whether the population is growing or reducing. And although they're little flying bugs, their larvae, their maggots live in the soil. And if you look closely, you can see that just like we trap the adults on the sticky cards, we can trap the young 
in a piece of potato, if you have fungus gnats flying around your uh, house plants, you can put a slice of potato on the soil surface and see if those are fungus gnats that you have. So here's the Steiner Nema feltiae. This is a roundworm that infects them. It's a biological pest control. It's just a microorganism that's entomophagous, insect eating. So understanding insects, their life cycles and what they are um, sensitive to can also help. I mix that up into water and then drench that down onto the, uh, the plants that I'm growing in the greenhouse. They swim through the soil and track down those fungus gnat larvae. You can see the sticky cards here. The one on the left is the oldest one that was left for one week in the greenhouse back in March. Um, you can see quite a lot of fungus gnats, but as time went on, fewer and fewer fungus gnats were picked up on the card. Um, and eventually the final card that I have <clears throat> on there is from March and that sticky card has almost any. Again, the larvae live in the soil. They're, they don't really um, damage the plants too much, Oops. Um, but they're more of a nuisance. They fly around and they bug us. So we use the roundworms to control them. It does take time. You saw there was a couple of months there of repeated treatments with that beneficial and uh, it's not a silver bullet, bullet, they don't all go away, but it does reduce the numbers. And in a greenhouse, it's a great alternative to using pesticides. It's something that I can do with my students around rather than having to kick them out of the greenhouse if I want to apply a chemical pest control. Uh, Anthony, would you show that third video, please? Like I said, we uh, did as much as we could to bring the students into the greenhouse and into the garden, even gave them some opportunities to blow off steam. You can see them making those flower pounding videos. We taught them skills. Here they are training and pruning the uh, hydroponic tomato crops. They grow on vines and those vines have to be trained, lifted up. Uh, and we were very successful in growing a wide variety of food crops, vegetable transplants, and also in um, providing food for our community. We grew not just food crops, but also um, flowering plants, vegetable transplants. Many of those were grown by the students themselves in partnership with local community gardens. We provided those plants as sort of a uh, not just food for the stomach, but also food for the soul. So the students uh, transplanted and propagated these begonias. They'll go out and decorate the greenhouse itself. So we'll use that for uh, our own facility and also for the gardens. And we grew vegetable, uh, not vegetable transplants, but potted flowering plants for uh, local gardens like Period Garden Park down near the Madison, um, down near the Capitol building in Madison. A way for students to give back to their communities. But again, something I love about horticulture is that it is integrated. We grew these pansies with a variety of different types of fertilizers. You don't have to understand the chemistry of the fertilizers to appreciate the beauty of the plants or even to grow the plants. But those are additional lessons that we can learn and that this, we can teach the students and learn from the plants. You can send the screen uh, back to me. Thank you, Anthony. So something I think that is very, very interesting is our earliest learners, our youngest students are put in kindergarten. Um, that term was invented by 
Friedrich Froebele, and he said that children are like tiny flowers. They're varied and need care, but each is beautiful alone and glorious when seen in the community of their peers. He was an educator who believed in hands-on learning. He loved nature, science, and math. And that's what I love about horticulture. I love combining all of those things together into all sorts of learning. Kinder refers to children and garden means garden, a garden for children, a place for children to learn, to play, to be nurtured, to explore, and hopefully for all of us to grow as we learn. Mata Wisconsin has a large number of school gardens. The Wisconsin School Garden Network keeps a map. If uh, you have a school garden and you're not on that, that map, check them out. Um, again, great places to grow. Garden-based learning is what they are focused on. Uh, and I wanna leave you with a few um, resources for garden-based learning in Wisconsin. So the School Garden Network, Wisconsin 4-H, this is project-based education, not just plant care and gardening, but also a lot of great resources there. Seed Your Future is a national campaign that um, is focused on encouraging people to consider careers with plants, not just in greenhouses and gardens. There are a wide range of things that you can do with plants and garden-based learning. Um, Closer to home where I am in Madison, we have Rooted. It's a Madison area collaboration on food, land, and learning. And uh, there are others throughout the state. One that I've um, learned about recently in Stevens Point is the Farm Shed, also focused on food systems and feeding their communities. If you are in Madison, please stop by the greenhouses. We are at 465 Babcock Drive and open during the week, once again, to the general public. I'm very, very pleased to be welcoming visitors back into the greenhouses and into the gardens. We're about two blocks apart. You can contact me uh, at the university. Again, my areas of expertise are ornamental plants and um, greenhouse cultivation. Johanna, thank you so much. And what a timely uh, time for your talk, given that people are planning their garden and now that campus is opening up. It's just such an exciting time for anybody uh, with a green thumb. Um, we do, and, and hello, Fran Paleo Moyer, Badger Talks producer, everybody. I always forget to introduce myself. Um, so we have a, uh, a question out here on YouTube from Tom Giroux, and he's asking, how did you pollinate the vegetables, uh, specifically cucumbers? So the cucumbers, I chose a cultivar that didn't need to be pollinated. The cultivar that I used was Diva. Yes, pollinating in a greenhouse where there's hopefully no bugs is a problem. So for the cucumbers, I selected a cultivar called Diva that is apomictic. It produces fruit whether it's pollinated or not. But we did have to pollinate the tomatoes and the peppers. And for that, we used student labor and a paintbrush. <laughs> so we, uh, we just taught the students how to be the pollinators. <laughs> Some larger greenhouses will actually bring in bumblebees as their pollinators. It's really pretty cool. You, um, I have too many people working in my greenhouse and they're really too small to buy a bumblebee hive, though I think it would be really, really neat. Um, but bumblebees are the preferred pollinators indoors. Honeybees get lost inside. They don't like being in, um, in greenhouses, but bumblebees, uh, their vision is just a little bit different and they can handle it in a greenhouse. So those are basically three answers to your question. Choose crop types that don't need pollination, pollinate by hand or bring in pollinators in the shape of um, insects. I so love that your presentation included utilizing bugs uh, to work against bugs. I thought that was really neat. And there's an awesome um, documentary out on Netflix called The Biggest Little Farm that, <laughs> that was such a great documentary about this 
couple who gets a farm out in California. But long story short, uh, they really utilize bugs on like a mass scale. Um, are you familiar with that documentary? I've, I've heard the name. I haven't checked it out yet, but we yeah. do a lot of work with beneficial pest controls. That's one of the things that I uh, encourage my students to look into. Oh, so fascinating. Um, so tell us, um, where would a beginner start if they were looking to start with hydroponics? Like what would you suggest as a very basic starting point? It really depends on how much work you want to put into it. Our lettuces were grown in um, hydroponic tanks that are very, very simple. Uh, and uh, the they were designed by a, a professor and master gardener at University of Minnesota. Tom Michaels, I think is his name. But it's a very simple, about a 30 gallon wooden tank that's lined with plastic. Uh, and I really like that system because you can just sort of set it and forget it. Um, and I've had really good success growing um, mostly leafy greens in there. We did lettuce and bought, we did a couple different types of lettuces and we did bok choy um, in those with the students. I tried strawberries in them, but strawberries don't like to have wet feet. They, they need to dry out between waterings. So they were pretty grumpy. Um, it took them a while to get started. Uh, and then I got spider mites. So I just scrapped the whole project because I didn't want to deal with spider mites. <laughs> um, it, again, it, it was sort of those, is it worth it to you to do this this year? Um, yeah, some, sometimes the pest control answer is not worth it. We're gonna get rid of the plants and start over. Um, so that's probably the simplest hydroponic setup that I can, can suggest is um, what's called deep water culture, which is a tank. And the, the beauty of this particular tank is it doesn't have any moving parts or electricity. Um, so you saw those roots that were on the plants hanging down, they just trail in the water. And as they grow down into the water, they, they take it up and you get a little bit of an air gap that also provides air. So usually if you had deep water culture, the plants, the whole root would be stuck in the water and you would need to aerate and add oxygen to the water. Um, but this setup with the, I think it's the, called the garden salad table, um, doesn't need that because it creates its own air gap. And the, the plant actually, if, if you went back to that picture, you'd see it has different roots at the bottom and at the top. Uh, and the, the plant sort of segregates its root systems and the upper roots they collect oxygen and the lower roots get the water and the nutrients. So that's okay. absolutely the easiest way. And that system I've been using for a couple of years. This year was the first year that I really got started in um, sort of heavy duty hydroponics. So we did two different um, systems. One was a Dutch bucket where there was a series of pumps that would flood the buckets and then drain them out. And then the other system that the cucumbers were growing in was slab culture. Um, and that is you simply, you know, irrigate them, let them drain, irrigate them, let them drain. It's just a timed pump um, and not nearly as, as difficult and as much infrastructure. So there's sort of three layers of hydroponics that I had going. The set it and forget it tanks, the slab culture, which we also call run to waste because the water just runs straight through. You don't recapture any of it. And then we had the Dutch bucket system, which had more integrated pumps. Things were on a timer so that they would flood the buckets, let the plants get wet, take up nutrients. That was where I had the three different types of media. And I think the reason that the ones in rock wool did the best was because the rock wool was the most absorbent of the three media. So it held the most moisture after uh, the water would drain back into the tank. That type also um, conserves a lot more water, but we also had difficulty um, and some data that I didn't share was that because you're constantly recirculating the same water, um, as the water gets moved out through evaporation into the plants for transpiration, a lot of nutrients get left behind and the water becomes very briny, very salty. Um, so we had to sort of manage for that as well, um, okay. just because we were using the same water again and again. Great, thank you. It's nice that there are many options for people who wanna get started. I appreciate that. Uh, one other question. So is are any of the plants and produce that the students uh, are producing, are they available for the public at all? Or does everything go to food pantries and whatnot? Um, we just chose last year to go through food pantries because they had the distribution 
apparatus. Um, I had a co-instructor who was actually on um, Badger Talks last year, Tom Bryan. He set those up um, since he had those food system uh, connections. And uh, I think we're, there, there's a few tomatoes and peppers left growing, but we're just about done with that. We'll start uh, probably again next year um, when I have students again. I want to have classes again. I have, I have students working. But um, yeah, we just chose to do that distribution through the food pantries to, you know, obviously we knew there was a need there. Uh, and then also just to make sure that things didn't go to waste because we weren't waiting around hoping that someone would get them. Great. That's really nice that you can do that for our community as well. Um, so tell us about the beautiful house at Allen Centennial Garden. What are the plans for that? Oh, yes. Everybody wants to know about the house. So the house is not technically part of the garden. It's what's called the Agricultural Dean's Residence. Uh, and if you don't know the history of the house, the house has been there for about 125 years now. Actually, exactly. It was built in 1896 for the first dean of the College of Agriculture. Uh, and it was lived in by the deans until about the 1950s, um, at which point the, the final dean, um, Dean Fred, who lived there, uh, became the president of the college. So sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the president's house. And he just kept living there because he liked it so much. When he retired, um, they actually allowed him to stay there. And he and his wife lived there. Um, I think he passed away in, in the 70s or 80s. And then it just became office spaces. Um, a few years ago, 10 years ago now, an effort was made to renovate it and bring it up to date. But with such an old house, um, they've run into a lot of difficulties. Mm -hmm. Currently, there is work being done with the UW Conference Centers, um, the group that run the Pyle Center and the Lowell Center. They are um, working with some architects and designers to put together a project uh, and to find funding to update it, renovate it, and create a new convention space, or not convention space, but conference space on campus. So it'll be meeting rooms, um, you know, dining room, and uh, an event space there in the garden, which should complement some of the garden's uh, events as well. Uh, we're not doing weddings yet. Again, the university hasn't yet allowed non-UW sponsored events to take place. Like I said, there will be um, concerts in the garden, but those are sponsored by the garden itself. Um, private events are not yet allowed in the garden. We're you know, hoping to hear soon this summer that we continue to open up. I mean, we just a month ago, we got people, visitors back into the campus buildings. Um, just before we started speaking, I heard a family walking through, um, pushing a stroller. So that was um, music so to your nice. ears. I'm yes, sure. it is so <laughs> nice to, to hear people coming back. Um, again, That's not great. all, not all of the staff are back in the offices yet. Um, you know, like the building manager comes in one day a week. I had to get keys from him for something. <laughs> Yeah. And where do people hear, hear, uh, see the upcoming events? So the Allen, uh, I didn't give you the Allen Centennial Garden website. Um, I just gave you my information. So it's allencentennialgarden.wisc.edu. Uh, and you should be able to find upcoming garden events on a calendar there. Okay, I'm just posting that in the chat. Uh, Thank you. Appreciate so. it, Fran. Perfect. Well, Johanna Ostork, thank you so much for sharing about teaching in the garden with us today. It was really a pleasure to hear all about your work and the work of the students that you're working with and teaching and mentoring. Thanks so much. Yeah, great talking to you, Fran. Thank you. Great. So join us. We're going to actually be featuring a celebration of June Dairy Month for the rest of the month. And you're going to see that Badger Talks Live is going to be shifting to more series events as we move to some in-person, uh, more in-person things. But we will be continuing the live stream and we'll be moving more to sort of a series format. So for June Dairy Month, June 8th, we'll be talking to people from the Dairy Innovation Hub. June 15th, we'll feature the Center for Dairy Profitability. June 22nd, Center for Dairy Research, and June 29th, we'll be talking to the Dairy Land, Dairy Land Initiative, who will be talking about cow, cow barns constructed for comfort, which I thought was very interesting. Please visit badgertalks.wist.edu, where you can see our upcoming schedule of talks. You can sign up for our email list. 
please consider a donation as Badger Talks Live is run by uh, funds from a grant from the Alumni Association. And you can host your own speaker. We have almost 400 faculty and staff that are available to give talks around the state virtually and now in person. All right, we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks so much.